Oh, there we go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the debates. I hope this turns out a little bit better than what our commander in cheese does. Today, I was asked to support operative fixation of calcaneal fractures. Here are my disclosures. I am a surgeon. I like to operate. <laughs> there is a surgical solution to everything. I have no financial disclosures. I am a card-carrying member of AO, and everyone knows that means always operate. <laughs> Surgeon's motto, you can't heal without steel. A surgeon is a physician that finished his training. Anybody disagree? <laughs> All right, these calcaneal fractures are also known as um, lover's fractures, Don Juan fractures, Casanova fractures, because they're sustained by males that are leaving the second floor through a window when their lover's spouse returns home. Um, what do we know? In 1912, Cotton said, the man who breaks his heel is done. Bankhart in 42 said, the results of crush fractures of the oscalcis are rotten. I say, displaced fractures of the calcaneus are freaking bad. Do something, make them better. <laughs> so these uh, constitute 2% of all fractures. It's the most frequent tarsal bone fracture. It's a disease of young men again, um, and it continues to present challenges for all that try to heal, deal with them. The anatomy is key here. Um, the tuber is a lever arm for propulsion in the lower extremity. Um, the anterior process uh, carries significant weight. It articulates with the calcaneal cuboid joint. Sustentaculum tail, tail is the uh, fulcrum for the FHL. The facets are very important. They, they support body weight. You've got all this weight in your body going through these little sets of bones down the bottom. Um, very exquisite machine. The injury is secondary to high axial uh, energy. Um, motor vehicle accidents fall from heights. Uh, the primary fracture line results in two fragments, the constant fragment, and um, the secondary lines run through um, either two phases and uh, creates a significant uh, injury when displaced. So um, 60 to 75% of these are displaced intraarticular injuries, 25 to 30 are extraarticular. There is a 10% association with spine fractures. So when you see a calcaneal fracture like this, you have to further examine the patient um, Ask them questions about back pain. Get a lateral x-ray if there's a question. We use the Sanders classification um, that's aided by <coughs> CT for evaluation and, and treatment direction. Historical treatment um, shows that it wasn't until the late 80s that we started fixing fractures. Uh, Bernerska, La Tournée, Sanders. How can you go wrong with this group? What the heck? They said fix them. Historical treatment, barbaric. <laughs> Look at this. Smashing people when they're asleep. What the heck? <laughs> Not good. Treatment options, uh, limited fixation or open fixation. Primary arthrodesis, personally that's something I never do. Um, amputation and then Non-operative is really small, way down there at the bottom. <laughs> Here's a Swedish study. It shows um, after the first year, there's really no difference. But at 8 to 12 years, in this, uh, in this prospective randomized controlled study, um, the, there was a significant reduction in pain in the operative group. And um, beside that, there was a significant decrease in post-traumatic arthritis. Only the Swedes can do something like this. Canadian studies showed that there was an improved outcome in women that were operated on. Who doesn't want to support something where women do well? I mean, what the <laughs> heck? 
surgical treatment. Indications include displaced articular fractures, anterior process fractures, displaced fractures of the calcaneal tuberosity because that eliminates this fine-tuned uh, force generator, um, and fractures, dislocations of the calcaneus, selected open fractures of the calcaneus. Relative contraindications. Well, in this case, they're relative. Uh, we could eliminate the diabetes and the smoking. That's for sure. Um, there's a 90% wound issue uh, when this trifecta is present. But, you know, we were trained to take care of wound issues. We know what to do with that. So here's a guy with a bad calcaneal fracture. Yeah, you know, he's got diabetes. He's a smoker. The good news is he's not employed. This isn't workman's comp. You have to look on the sunny side of things. So, um, Fuller's angle, he killed it, clearly. Smashed the angle of Gusain. Little skin problem, not a big deal. You just wait, watch this thing elevated, compressive dressings, be patient or wait for the skin to return. You see some wrinkle, green light, go get it. So the goals of treatment are maintenance and support of the lateral column of the foot. That's extremely important. Get that valgus out of there. Uh, you want to uh, dynamically um, stabilize the foundation for body weight, weight and uh, you know, reproduce the, uh, the mechanical advantage of the heel. Um, Susan, do you, do you want to uh, put somebody in these shoes for the rest of their life? What a fashion faux pas. And these babies are expensive, I'm telling you. So like Nike, just operate. Or as we say in the south side of Bethlehem, fix that Mo Gator. <laughs> um, and I rest my case. Thank you, Dr. Lands, for your help with this. Yeah, I've already lost. <laughs> that is great. Well, I find myself tasked with the dubious uh, challenge of advocating for non-operative management of this injury and opposing the eminent Dr. DeLong, uh, which I would never want to do. So uh, I'll do my best here and talk to you a little bit about why non-operative management of this injury should be considered. And it's not just non-operative management of the calcaneus, but non-operative management of this patient's calcaneus fracture. And that's where I think the key comes into play in my argument. We already talked a little bit about the, the magnitude of these operative contraindications in the outcomes of patients with these severe injuries. So this gentleman, for example, has diabetes. He is a smoker. He has all of the sequela of those disease states. And others other um, possibilities for other patients include immunosuppression, neuropathic disease, um, issues in the elderly, uh, non-compliant patients, and surgeons with um, inexperience or even in those of us that are experienced with tremendously challenging cases that can lead to less than optimal outcomes if you take the surgical route. Um, operative contraindications have been discussed for since we began trying to fix these injuries surgically um, with gusto around the turn of the century. Um, again, the, the triple whammy of diabetes, vascular insufficiency, and smoker uh, representing at up to 90% rate of complications. So why would you want to put your patient through that risk? if they already had those risk factors present. If this was an open fracture, his risk would be even greater. And especially with medial, uh, the dramatic medial wounds that they can um, uh, present with, if the 
level, of, if the grade of the open fracture is, is uh, 3B, then 77% of those patients will end up with an infection and 46% with BKAs. Now this is earlier literature, this is 2003, but even with our most more recent studies, um, there's a lot of recommendations leading towards less invasive surgical interventions. Um, I would argue that non-invasive interventions may be key for a, a large patient population. Um, even with our most recent literature, the incidence of wound complications as, uh, associated with the popular lateral extensile approach ranged from 7 to 37 percent. That's a huge number, a huge number to carry around with you. And you know the patient sits at the edge of your bed each night. And these things weigh heavy on your soul. Um, wound complications with the traditional approach have also been associated with a number of um, factors, including the, uh, the Sanders classification, the number of residents and surgeons operating in the case, the number of people in the operating room at the time of surgery, and again, with this gentleman, tobacco use and diabetes. So we, you know, we go into the operating room and it's a big party and everybody's having a good time. I am a surgeon and I too love to operate, but some of the things that we bring down on these people may be more, more um, uh, uh, put them at a disadvantage more than an advantage. Even simpler things that aren't quite as devastating like sural nerve injury um, and tibial nerve injury show significant percentages in the population of operative patients. So you can avoid all of that simply by not operating. It doesn't mean that you're afraid of the surgery. It doesn't mean that you're scared or running away from the surgery or disavowing the surgery. But you have to make very careful decisions when it comes to this particular patient population. This guy is a surgical risk. Are you ready to assume that risk? you'd better be very sure that you've carefully considered all of your options. There are many different options for treatment, and some of them of the best or um, most supported in the literature may not be right for your patient at that moment in your office as you make the decision together. So every case has to be assessed individually, and the risks and benefits must be discussed in detail. Sometimes less is more. And we all know that there is no way to avoid all risks. And in some patients, no way to avoid risk at all because you're already starting at a deficit. As a final thought, remember, when you have a complication, it's not you that has the complication, it's the patient. When you're making a decision together, it's not you that's facing that, the magnitude of that decision, it's your patient. So it's super important to educate patients like this gentleman about their risk factors and the, the options that they have, including non-operative management. You need to empower your patient. Never talk down to them. Never um, use terms that they can't understand, speak in normal language, but engage them and empower them to be an equal partner in the decision making. Um, the first slide failed to tell you that the gentleman said, I don't want surgery. And so you need to respect that. And therefore, the answer is obvious, non-operative management. Always start every one of your conversations with a patient that you're thinking about operating on with the statement, I want to go over your options. This injury can be treated surgically and non-surgically. And if the answer is surgery, you first state that the, that the non-operative management would go along in this fashion, and this is why I don't recommend it. For this gentleman, my discussion would be your risks are significant and the outcomes will be adequate and you're with non-operative management and it's better than the complications that you face ahead. You have to understand the patient that you're dealing with. Every single surgical decision that you make, and this is just one example, whether you're taking care of this patient or this patient, or someone somewhere in between. Heavy is the head, my friends. So as you enter into the operating room, which is what we all love to do, remember there's a world of sins hiding underneath that vac dressing there, and you do not want to be that guy or gal. So don't operate on this gentleman. Thank you. So 
let's get the uh, ARS question. So actually, can I get the title slide? Sorry, the ARS question doesn't have the whole case. And I just want to say real quick, um, th those were really great. And I, I, um, Dr. DeLong really had me cracking up, um, almost to tears. That was really funny for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, these debates, I don't think we're trying to say, like, there's a definite answer. Certainly not for the topic in general. Now, I tried to sort of phrase it in, in a case. But I think that you know, if you at least understand the extremes and what are the arguments for, for the extremes, I think that you'll be able to make better, you know, better decisions for your particular patient, for your particular case, because you know, the, the answer is gonna, is gonna change based on your case. So hopefully, if that's the expectation, you're not thinking like, you know, well, I didn't really get an answer to this. You're just trying to really see what does the literature speak to in, in either direction. So let's uh, take a vote on this particular case. Hopefully you had enough time to look at that. I'm going to vote too. All right, well, um, if I'm reading this correctly, operative. Uh, you guys are just trying to be nice. Operative 30%, non-op 70%. So Dr. Harding is our, is our winner. I would operate on that in 10 seconds flat. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I think uh, that was a great uh, debate session. Any final comments? No, just that I think what you said is exactly right. When you do these debates, you're just kind of seeing the broad spectrum and obviously, they're very extreme, kind of ridiculous, one side or the other. But those arguments that you hear, you can incorporate into your conversations with your patients. All right? That's very important to explain the broad spectrum of their options, even if it's not the path you're going to lead them down. Yeah, I would say, I would say. Am I on? OK, yeah. Um, in the real world, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> And funny? When I got the assignment, I thought to myself, they mixed it up because I knew that you were you, you, could, uh, you could talk to my residents. <laughs> Everything has to be perfect. I think calcaneal uh, fracture fixation surgically, the pendulum is swinging the other way. Uh, if things aren't right, you actually create more harm than you help with. And um, it's important to recognize that it's a very difficult area to work well in, and those of us that have failed uh, know, know what the consequences are. So you have to be very careful. Uh, the, uh, doing this presentation today was like me voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Uh, but wait, I just have to I'm say gonna, one tiny, tiny thing. The majority of the calcaneuses that I'm fixing now, and we can talk about it with the other people, I'm doing through a minimally invasive approach now, which really is a game changer, so. So let's, uh, I'm going to get Dr. Reed's comment, but let's get the next group up. We have the clavicle 